And it's a pleasure to be back. I always accept Bill Dutton's invitations. And it's a special honor to get the opening, uh, the opening slot. So I'm going to take advantage of that, and I shouldn't stand in front of my slides there, sorry, uh, both to frame the e-social science uh, briefly and uh, to talk about one particular set of issues which I think is challenging in this area of digital social research. Now, for those of us who've been involved with the program since its early days, you know that the e-social science kind of transmogrified into be calling uh, digital social research and had two themes or has two themes, one being the social studies of e-science and the other being the use of e-science methods in the social sciences. And my talk is a bit of both. It's mostly looking at science, but I want to come back around and think about some of the social science uh, implications uh, directly. My concern, having studied data practices for the last decade or so, is what are those motivations for sharing data, which is a very big policy push around the world right now. And uh, specifically, I want to talk about the reproducibility aspects. The digital part is around data. These four big categories of uh, observational, experimental, <laughs> computational, and records that come from this 2005 report are big umbrellas, but in fact, data means almost all things to all people, and there's many subtleties, as you will see. The second circle, the social, this uh, deluge of data is raining down upon all fields. Much of it is runoff. The deluge metaphor works in, in several ways. It's not being captured, it's not being curated, and there, there's real concerns about what should be captured and used. And I think this is part of the policy driver that uh, the question is, how can we leverage the public resources that are being invested in generating this massive amount of data? Thirdly, the data sharing policies. Real action is being taken. This is not a, a really a theoretical issue. These are a few well-known examples. The data management plans are now required in all new grant proposals for many, if not most, major funding agencies. Explicit data sharing requirements are being posed. The ESRC, under which the eSocial Science lives, is uh, the most explicit around data reuse. There's some clauses in there saying you have to show no other data exists to reuse before we will fund creating new data. Okay. Lots of sticks behind this, more than carrots. They will withhold the last uh, payment on your grant and various other things until you start releasing your data. Okay. So why, why should we share research data? The arguments for it, the rationales, tend to be much more implicit than explicit. I have a long paper coming out in JSIST, as uh, Blaze knows very well. We're, we're down to the third round of the uh, page proofs, dealing with uh, uh, fine points of uh, grammar and etiquette at this stage. Uh, but I'm going to focus today just on this first one, on uh, the need to reproduce or to verify research, which is the argument that you hear most commonly from these funding agencies for reasons to share research data. That argument for reproducibility and replication is coming not just from the policymakers, you're finding it fairly deeply embedded in the science itself. This is a special issue of Science Magazine, sort of the, the companion to nature on, on this side of the pond. This was December 2011, very recent, a whole issue on data replication. The, as you'll see, the uh, opening editorial here says replication is the scientific gold standard. A number of articles in this piece and they talk about how we need to change the practice of science now that we have all these data to make science more replicable. And open access to data is one of the arguments that's being made for uh, increasing reproducibility and replication. But as social scientists, we know that uh, reproducibility is actually a very messy concept. Uh, Victoria Stodden at Columbia University, I believe, has been here to OII as well at some point. I think so. Uh, who, hasn't, who hasn't been through OII at some point, Bill? Um, is uh, here, 
in the deductive sciences, if you're a mathematician, replication means can you verify the proof? If you are in experimental sciences, go back out in the field and do it again. Can somebody else get the same answer? If you're in the computational sciences, which is the real floods of data, it's more reconstructing the workflow, the kinds of things that uh, Dave DeRoar has spent a lot of time thinking about. This is from the proteomics area and the other omics fields. It's another article from that same December 11, uh, 2011 science issue. Even here, notice the subtleties, analytic validity. Do different labs, techniques, and platforms measure the same thing? Can other scientists access the data and protocols, repeat the analyses, and get the same results? So even within narrow fields, we have very different definitions of what reproducibility might mean. And then the question of what data are replicable or what data and procedures you need to replicate or reproduce a particular study. The notion that you cannot step in the same river twice applies for picking up water samples as well as sort of a, a metaphor for life. I mean, you, if we go back to the beach tomorrow or the river tomorrow, we're not going to get the same sample. And similarly, we can get the digital records, but it's not clear you're going to get the same thing. Open data has a big push right now, but open, uh, open code is another area that's gotten very big, and that's one where Victoria Stodden is spending a lot of her research. She's a statistics PhD with a background in economics and law as well. Because so much of today's scientific data are being produced with instrumentation and software associated with them, you can't actually make sense of the data unless you have the code that generated them. Much of that code is proprietary, so that's part of the push for open source, and that is, would be one of the requirements to make the data, uh, the program actually replicable. This uh, comes over into some of the areas that we've been working on in our data practices research is what actual unit might we be thinking about of replicability? Usually we are thinking about one paper. You know, the arguments around science are can somebody else reproduce that paper? But in fact, we're finding that it's rare to have a one-to-one -one relationship between a data set or a field trip and one particular paper. It may be many trips to the field to produce one paper, one trip to the field might produce multiple paper, papers, or one paper might be built on a decade, a career's worth of data. So what, actually, what data actually needs to be released with a paper to make it replicable? Provenance has uh, two distinct meanings. In the arc of a world, it means the chain of custody is who has, had, who has touched it, who has had access to it over time. And so those data sets may be passed off through lots of grad students, postdocs, investigators. In the computer science world, particularly the work around semantic web and WC3, it's transformations from the original state. In either case, as data get moved through software in many hands, people make decisions around interpretation, around data cleaning, around outliers, around handling missing data that often are not very well documented, and all those things interfere with the ability to replicate a study. Then, of course, there's good old tacit knowledge. Given the paper and the data set, could any of us in the room reproduce a proteomics paper? Any, anyone? No, no. Not in this room, anyway. OK. So many things at stake here. So I want to walk through uh, some case examples to show what might be at stake here. The rationales you will find most common around reproducibility are these. Uh, it will resolve scientific disputes. It may confirm claims, particularly in areas of uh, peer review, protect, uh, prevent fraud, and also it should protect the public interest and that investment that we made. Uh, so first off, resolving disputes. Harry Collins has uh, spent a career looking at some of these issues, particularly in physics. And he found, uh, starting in the mid-1970s, that one group of scientists found that valid experiments were those that detected gravitational waves. And another group of scientists said that valid experiments were the ones that failed to detect gravitational waves. 
So what we really have here is paradigm conflicts rather than something that is a true issue of reproducibility. And I found this of an article in Physics World that came out less than a year ago. The opening line is astronomers could be on the cusp of detecting gravi gravitational waves after four decades of trying. Okay. A few paragraphs later, you get um, another team said, these projects have simply taken the wrong option. Okay. <laughs> so four decades of trying to reproduce gravitational waves research has not resolved this particular set of, of disputes. Okay. Similarly, whenever a scientific paper is withdrawn from a major publication and questions of fraud arise, also what arises is what did the peer reviewers know, what should they have known, what should they have done, would open access to data, would open access to code and software have prevented this particular fraud. The uh, Wu Suk Wong case is well known. This was from 2004 when they first claimed to have cloned human embryos, harvested stem cells. We were going to solve Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's and who knows uh, what all else. Within two and a half years, he was on trial not only for fraud, but for embezzlement and was stripped of um, all of his honors in Korea. And there were, there were multiple papers involved. But these are the kinds of questions that arose is, you know, how are the data used and what is the responsibility of peer reviewers? Uh, everyone in this room has probably spent, uh, done many, many peer reviews and I doubt that very many of you have actually tried to go back and reconstruct the data in any given paper. In very few fields does that get done. You look for va face validity, you look for argument, you look for uh, you know, whatever standard statistical tests and other validations you can find, but rarely is it really the responsibility. It's hard enough to get people to review papers at all, much less to get them to go back and do that level of analysis. Okay. Here is another one. This is from just a couple of weeks ago in Science Magazine. If you haven't been following uh, the avian flu, some papers in the Netherlands, at least one of them is from the, the Netherlands, have found a way to demonstrate how the flu virus can jump from animal models into human models. This has raised huge concerns about biosecurity. The U.S. National Science Vi Advisory Board for Biosecurity has uh, weighed in on this, found the potential risk of public harm to be of unusually high magnitude, and asked that these papers and these manuscripts be greatly limited in the experimental details and results. So, they are claiming to protect the public interest, we need to suppress the paper, which presumes that if you had the paper, you could replicate the research and you could cause uh, quite amount of terrorism, and they say it's an unprecedented recommendation. Well, other people are calling this censorship. The article is accompanied by a response from the authors who talk about the five years that they spent getting the reviews, the international bodies they had to pass through, what it took to get the materials, the small number of people in the world actually capable of reproducing this research, and at the same time claiming exactly the counter to this that unless the research is replicated, they will not be able to develop the vaccines and respond to exactly this kind of biosecurity risk. So even when you try to make claims of reproducibility around access to data, uh, the whole problem seems to, uh, seems to cut both ways. So is sharing data indeed the gold standard for uh, verifying quality control? And, uh, and does it cut both ways? I think it's a, a problematic argument, and if we have time in discussion or throughout the day, I think we all should, should think about what the implications are, not o only for some of the funding agency policies, but think about the implications for data curation. If the concern is to curate data around each individual paper, we may find ourselves developing nice little stovepipes as opposed to building 
uh, nice repositories of data in standard forms that we could use to mine and find new knowledge. So those reasons for sharing data might actually be at odds with each other, which is what takes us back to the metaphor in my title about whether it is indeed the, the uh, gold standard or whether we're sending ourselves off down another path. I think, you know, fool's gold, the, the pyrite is a bit overstated, but it's more um, trying to make the point of whether it is misguided, whether it is fruitful, and, and where it might be fruitful. Uh, it also is something that we've not talked very much about in the social sciences. Uh, this is, let's see, uh, you notice the date. This is 10 March 2012. This is a Saturday issue of Discover Magazine and a nice little paper coming out. A psychologist at Yale has published a scathing attack on a paper that failed to replicate one of his most famous studies. Okay. Um, his post on his own blog on Psychology Day, a mixture of critiques of the science within the paper, personal attacks against the researchers, against PLOS One, the journal that published it, and against this fellow in Discover Magazine who covered it. Okay. So the social sciences also were going to have very similar kinds of debates. It's not just about reproducibility and replication in science. It's even harder in social science to go back and replicate uh, studies. So uh, to conclude, and I hope I'm leaving a few minutes for questions here, is uh, to make the argument that reproducibility and replication are drivers of the data sharing policies, the US, UK, uh, the continent, and elsewhere, that reproducibility is claimed as a gold standard for at least these reasons, and we can come up with more, that it will resolve disputes, confirm claims, and it will protect the public interests, and I hope I've uh, called all of those into question. You know, certainly there's plenty of cases where repli replicability can be done, it's important to be done, but we need to take it with a very large grain of salt, or uh, grains of pyrite at least, to, uh, to think about what, what really happens. So reproducibility is, is a, so a social process. It's, it's not just scientific disputes, it's paradigm disputes, it's epistemological disputes, it's policy disputes, and uh, tacit knowledge and interpretation are critical no matter how hard uh, the science might be. So I think this is an exemplar problem for digital social research. It's one that my team is just starting to dig into as we look at workforce issues, other kinds of data curation, and I think there's one where there's room for um, many of us to, uh, to toil and explore. I think if we hadn't had this, these number of years of digital social research to bring people together at this intersection, we might not have had the opportunity to discuss some of these issues. So thank you. Can we take a couple so questions? We, yeah, or we need we to can. wait. Okay, good. In the meantime, Stuart, you set up. Yeah. Okay. Yes, please. I see one issue that you haven't touched upon, especially for reproducing social science research is privacy. Oh yes, I, I deliberately was only really dealing with the science. Yeah, the quali yeah qualitative, and you get into uh, you get into medical research, uh, and it's. But the, the medical research, actually, there's a big, um, a, a big move for reproducibility, uh, and there's very sophisticated ways to, to strip the identity from records, but there's also very sophisticated statistical ways to re-identify records. So that is a whole set, but we've, we've spent most of our time looking at, at the sciences. Other questions before we move on? Okay, we have the rest of the day. Okay, thank you. <laughs>